Hello, welcome to Life and Life Only. This is an addendum to the debate, or perhaps discussion is a better word, I had with Ricky Green of the University of Kent. Now, uh, I'm hoping that Ricky isn't going to be listening to this, because I'm going to be a, a little bit tougher than I was during the actual discussion. I'd invited him onto my programme, I think it was his first podcast appearance, and um, I was very polite, sometimes even apologetic, and when I was listening back to it, I was kind of cringing slightly at how, I don't know, English I was being, <laughs> putting caveats and qualifying everything I said. And then I edited some of that out to make it a bit more direct and the pace a bit faster on both sides. And I hope you enjoyed that episode, if you did indeed listen to it. But I had quite a few notes and there were things that I didn't say at the time. So I wanted to go through the rest of my notes and then see what other thoughts came to mind. So the topic really is about conspiracy theories again i feel like we are constantly in this territory but really the central point to make clear at the beginning is that when we're talking about that it's actually other people that tag what you say as a conspiracy theory and you as a conspiracy theorist for example i have not spent really any time on the moon landings i haven't really spent much time on princess diana's death although those who were around in 1997, you remember, I mean, they were whisperings. I worked in an office at that time, and there were already people talking about that. So people are very open to the idea. And in fact, since I posted the talk with Ricky, I've had quite a bit of feedback, a few comments and personal emails and things like that. And people really enjoyed it, and people didn't dismiss it. And in fact, on my, let's call it my main podcast, my most popular podcast up to now, Glass Onion on John Lennon, I have brought up these kind of topics and I just had James Corbett of the CorbettReport.com to do a review of the US versus John Lennon, the documentary. And he is what a person who only watches mainstream TV would probably call a hardcore conspiracy theorist. But James has been studying this kind of thing for, I think, 15 years now. And he spent a lot of time researching it. I used to spend quite a lot of time researching things, but that's fallen off quite badly, which is perhaps another reason why I didn't really go hard on the points that I wanted to make but uh, yeah the central point really is that certain people have a belief that the mainstream view of the world is very very limited somewhat deliberately perhaps something to do with the shortened attention span of the general public including myself you know I have to work very hard personally I don't know if you do this as well to keep my attention span. For example, just little things like uh, trying to listen to albums all the way through or trying to watch films or documentaries all the way through and not watching them in sound bites, so to speak. When I recorded the talk with Ricky and when I edited it as well, I really did feel that we were speaking two different languages, although we did find some common ground and it was all very friendly and I was happy about that. But there were things to be said that um, weren't really resolved in the time we had then. So one of the first things I actually asked Ricky, he had told me on an email that he used to be into conspiracy theories. And I made the point that he, that made it sound a bit like it was a disease that he'd got over. It was interesting to hear him say, uh, I was a lot younger then. Now, this is a very common thing you will find. And I had it in my meetup group a few weeks ago. In fact, there was um, a couple of people older than me. I mean, I'm in my 40s, but they were in their 60s. And not to say they weren't open-minded about certain things, but... One of them said, oh, you know, all this sort of challenging government narratives, it's all very... They make it made it sound like it's a phase that you go through when you're young, which comes across as a bit patronising, because that makes it sound like if you grow up, you will no longer challenge government narratives. So Ricky talked about Zeitgeist, and Zeitgeist was quite seminal for me, and I still believe in Peter Joseph. I just think there are a few things in those Zeitgeist films which... Again, I haven't really researched whether Jesus existed or not, for those who know the film. But the stuff about the Federal Reserve in Zeitgeist Addendum and the economic hitman, that was pretty solid. And Ricky agreed with me that the third Zeitgeist film, Zeitgeist Moving Forward, was pretty solid as well. And that wasn't really even going into what you might call conspiracy territory. That was just uh, explaining, to some extent, how the world works. And that's really what myself and James Corbett and Julian of The Mind Renewed that's all, what we're trying to do, really. And I think I said to Ricky at the time, those people do exist who just latch on to conspiracy theories because they're trying to, I don't know, fill a hole. You know, it is true that conspiracy theories do seem to answer something that's been missing. However, 
if we're talking about certainty, this was one of the things that came up in one of the papers. I can't remember. There's one that he did with Karen Douglas and there's one that Karen Douglas did independently a few years earlier that um, Dr. Dentith and Julian were talking about on The Mind Renewed. I'll put that episode in the show notes. This idea of conspiracy theories apparently wanting certainty. But again, think about it. What is more symptomatic of wanting certainty than to watch a five or ten minute news bulletin? You know, watch the evening news or the morning news, whatever it is, when you're on your way to work and deciding that you're informed, that that's basically all you need to know. Even if you don't say that, it's clear that Ricky at some point and many others had rejected the idea of an alternative and had pretty much decided that the news sources which we are told are the the most solid. So, you know, as I said, in, in England, BBC, ITV, Channel 4 has always been known for being slightly edgy, I suppose, but not really. Sky News, and then in America, CNN. And, of course, the big enemy is Fox, but... At the risk of being called right wing, and we'll get to that in a minute, that was another thing that I found quite comical when I was actually editing the original talk back. Anyway, it seems like Glenn Beck was one of the first people at Fox, and um, Geraldo, who I consider a bit of a clown now, but as James Corbett reminded me, Geraldo was actually responsible for the news item on Fox about the soldiers guarding the poppy fields in Afghanistan, which may well explain a lot of the Afghanistan war or invasion. Getting back to this thing of uh, conspiracy theories being tagged, conspiracy theorists, sorry, being tagged as young and immature and impressionable and wanting certainty. Like I say, you know, when I talk to, you know, my parents' generation and my parents themselves, in fact, they will say, you know, before the internet, no one really questions anything. If you got, I don't know, maybe Private Eye or the 14 Times or one of those magazine slash newspapers that you can get in in the shops private eye will tell you all about government corruption although then they'll they'll have all these nice little captions with tinfoil hats when you actually get anywhere too near the truth so yeah I, i completely reject that idea and this idea of intellectual laziness which came up in another thing i was reading i think that may have been cass sunstein i can't remember cass sunstein famously did a a paper on conspiracy theories and recommended that uh groups of, uh, I would say, alternative thinkers that, that they get infiltrated. And then uh, I think at one point I asked Ricky, and I made it clear that I wasn't joking, I was actually being serious. At what point do you get tagged a conspiracy theory? Is it, is it when you believe in two, three, four, five, or you just seem to have a conspiracy mindset? And I don't think we really resolved that, but I think I think the idea was of, of a conspiracy mindset, really. But again, my counter to that is there's such a thing as a compliant mindset. You know, Darren Brown's team, when he's doing these TV programs, and you can decide with how much, how real they actually are, they find people for that one he did called Push, which may well still be on Netflix. They found the most compliant person they could and followed them and, and saw all the signs of being compliant. So my counter to Ricky and Karen Douglas and others would be, you could investigate that as well. Do a paper on that, find out what kind of people comply. So I don't really understand... I don't quite get the value of just isolating a certain pocket of people. And he, he did say that there are actually hundreds or even thousands of people involved in this study. So fair enough, you know, that's a fairly big number. But again, it, it's completely disregarding researchers. Or well, you don't even need to be a researcher. But it's just people with open minds who don't have certain subjects off the table. That's the problem. With mainstream output, a certain amount is, is simply off the table. And you don't really realise until someone alerts you to it. And then when you watch it, you realise how limited it is. That was one point. And, you know, there were certain facts that we didn't really get to because we didn't really tackle particular conspiracies. So 9-11 is one. I haven't made my mind up at all, but I did hear, and it seemed to be true, that Bin Laden was never actually prosecuted for 9-11. And there's a good documentary called 9-11 Press for Truth. And it's all about a group called the Jersey Girls so named, uh, presumably they came from New Jersey, and they'd all lost their husbands or partners in the disaster. I think it was in the Twin Towers. And they were almost the sole reason why there was any investigation, because essentially there was no investigation. Um, James Corbett's videos have shown that the evidence was all trucked away very, very quickly, was taken away quite hilariously, and there, there are so many strange anomalies the company that took my way was called controlled demolition inc you know you could not make it up 
And I'm saying that because obviously with Building 7, one of the theories is that it was a controlled demolition. And, um, you know, if we just take another event, the supposed killing of Osama bin Laden, again, there were people questioning that at the time. There were these videos of bin Laden, he seemed to be getting younger. And I remember even, it, I think it was either Sky News or BBC, the reporter was actually saying, hmm, well, it doesn't quite look like him. He looks a lot younger now. You know, why did they kill him? Apparently it's officially been said that he was unarmed. There was talk of him using his wife or one of his wives as a human shield, but that turned out to be false. So he was defenceless. Apparently you want to stop terrorism and keep people safe. You have no interest in uh, continuing terrorism and the war on terror, apparently. So why not take him in? Then you could waterboard him a hundred and whatever times as they did with uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to get the answers that you want, but just to kill him and then the burial at sea and everything. I mean, I wish to some extent that I had maybe tackled uh, Ricky on that, but I don't imagine that he would have known anything else because I think what came out to me was that the events come and go and the news cycle really dominates everything. That seems very clear to me that still the majority of the public are just, their attention goes to the news cycle. And there's a good reason for that. You know, we are social beings. So, for example, if you work in an office or you work in any place where there's lots of people around you, and they're talking about the news, and you don't, you haven't been following the news, maybe because you don't believe in mainstream news. You might get ridiculed or ostracised. Yeah, that's a big thing. As I said to Ricky, you know, David Icke, think what you like about him. He made a very good point that we hold each other back. You know, we're worse than sheep because we don't need a sheepdog. We keep each other in line. But yeah, the Bin Laden thing, it just goes away. You know, nobody thinks about it anymore. You know, and they can write papers about conspiracy theorists. And another thing that came up, again, that wasn't really resolved, and I, I wish it had been, is that I made the point that um, someone had said to me, when a conspiracy theory turned out to be true, they said, all right, that's conspiracy fact now. But instead of accepting then that there might be something behind theories, they can say, that's a fact, so I can continue ridiculing conspiracy theories. And I don't think Ricky quite understood what I was talking about, but think about that for a second. That is so absurd. It almost seems like you're just looking for something to ridicule and you know there are psychological reasons for that i don't want to go into it very deeply here but you know there's a reasons to do with protection we all protect ourselves you know and sometimes there's certain truths that we don't want to hear so we we filter them out and we protect ourselves and obviously i've made the point many many times people have got mortgages kids a job that they could easily lose should they say the wrong thing or should they seem to be uh, i don't know going off the rails almost, you know. Imagine you work in an office and you suddenly have a realisation, oh my God, you know, we're being lied to, you know, this is all a load of rubbish, and you start following Corbett or Ike or whoever, and you suddenly have a realisation, and then you start doing a bit of research, and it all seems to be true. And again, it's not about the moon landings or Princess Diana or anything like that. In a way, that's almost entertainment. You know, I would like to know what happened with the moon landings. I just simply don't know, because I haven't studied it. But uh, if you had that realisation and you started talking to people about it, there's a fair chance that you might lose your job. You know, almost like Howard Beale in Network. If you haven't seen Network, you really, you really should. And I have a theory as well about the Oscars as well, which I'll tell you in a second. But Howard Beale, uh, the famous line is, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And he starts saying stuff which I would say is basically truthful. And of course, uh, because of the manner in which he says it, he starts shouting it. They all think he's gone mad. And by the way, you know, you might wonder... You might say, well, you know, if Network is giving the truth, why did it get so many Oscars? And my counter is, yes, it, it got Oscars, but essentially uh, Peter Finch's character, Howard Beale, comes across as a, as a mad prophet. So as far as I think the majority of the audience watching that are concerned, there's a bits of truth in what he said, but he's just a madman. That's what you get tagged as. You either get laughed at or called mad, or both. Or people will start getting really angry if you get too close to the truth. Just to go back to that point about, you know, how many theories you have to believe in to be tagged a conspiracy theorist. Let's take the JFK assassination. Now, the last poll I saw, which was ages ago, it's probably a decade or more ago, over 50% of Americans didn't believe that Oswald acted alone. So essentially, if that's all it takes to become a conspiracy theorist, that means half of America are conspiracy theorists. See, this doesn't make any sense. Again, it makes sense for a, a certain group of people who just latch onto conspiracies. But then, going back to my counter, I could say the majority of the public latch on to the official versions of things. How much more evidence do you need that official versions can be flawed? 
Now, people always bring up the fact that um, relatively few conspiracy theories turn out to be true. And uh, I was discussing Watergate with James Corbett when he was on Glass Onion, the US versus John Lennon. There's a video version on YouTube if you care to watch that. And uh, we kind of agreed that that was a sort of a nice, a nice, <laughs> sorry about that, not nice, an official bloodless conspiracy that kind of proves that the system works. And Ricky brought it up a couple of times. And I totally understand why he did, because he's not investigating anything behind the news. And in fact, he said at one point, it can affect relationships. And he's right, you know, it's a better life if you don't investigate it. But some, some people have an instinct to do that. And it doesn't mean they're heroes, it doesn't mean they're special in any way. It's just an instinct and an interest in doing that. But, uh, yeah, Watergate doesn't seem hugely important. And, wow, what a controversial statement that is, isn't it? But when you take into account what the church committee found, and James and I talked about that, to do with MK Ultra, COINTELPRO, and Ricky was aware of the Gulf of Tonkin and Operation Northwards, they're all true things. And even if you bring Snowden into the equation now, Tom Secker has expressed many doubts about Snowden. How did he get access to all these documents, etc.? But let's take the mainstream version of it, that Snowden found these documents and blew the whistle. If you'd said to someone before 2013, I think that was, oh, you know, the NSA is reading everyone's emails, or potentially reading. It's not they're actually reading their emails, it's just that they would be able to. If you were a, a dissident, if you were causing any trouble, they could read your emails. That would have been laughed at. But then it, it appears in the mainstream news and everyone accepts it. But then they don't change any of their views about conspiracy theories. It's a very interesting uh, mind trick almost. Now, just to take uh, one example of an event that was very, very suspicious and relatively recently, if you think in terms of JFK or RFK, they were in the 60s, the death of Dr. David Kelly, the weapons inspector, 2003. Again, I just cannot believe that the Iraq war has just been allowed to pass into history and George Bush can now write a book and do all his little bits of art and he's just got a free pass. But let's take um, the issue with David Kelly. Now, Dr. David Halpin, who I believe is a trauma surgeon, retired. He's gone on many podcasts talking about this. And as far as I know, what I know of his biography, he's never shown any signs of being a conspiracy theorist or a loony or anything like that. But he simply looked at the evidence and decided that it didn't add up, the official version, that he committed suicide. So again, you know, he's not a conspiracy theorist, as far as I know. And uh, Liberal MP Norman Baker investigated this. Again, as far as I know, an establishment figure, politician. And he found that there was um, something wrong. Didn't believe the official version, wrote a book about it. And... BBC Radio, they were talking about this and the smugness you just can't believe it and someone says, oh have you read his book and it's like, oh I don't need to read it, conspiracy theory if you listen to that and you really think about it and listen to the tone and listen to the fact they don't need to read the book this is the point, it's almost the Bridget Jones thing, I won't dignify that with an answer never thought I'd be quoting Bridget Jones <laughs> one of the films Colin Firth says, you know, I won't dignify that with an answer. That's the whole thing. No one actually wants to investigate it. They just want to dismiss it. And if you give them evidence, they won't look at it. Not everyone, of course. Some people. Still the majority, I'm afraid. 19 minutes to nine. Of all the reshufflees yesterday, the most eyebrow-raising, jaw-dropping even, was Norman Baker, the Lib Dem MP, was moved from a post of transport to the Home Office. Why were eyebrows raised? Because Norman Baker has taken a rather conspiratorial view of one or two security matters. He wrote a book called The Strange Death of David Kelly, uh, the government scientist who sadly, sadly took his life after being exposed as a source of suggestions that government had sexed up a dossier on Iraq. Norman Baker suggested he may have been murdered. Here he is talking to Andrew Marr about the case in 2007. He had been told by a, a, a friend who was senior in the security services uh, that this was a, quote, wet disposal. Uh, and what, wet dis what was wet disposal? I asked him. Wet disposal means that uh, it was a hurried job and he was killed in a hurried way. That's apparently what wet disposal means. Actually, that wasn't from him talking to Andrew Marr. That was actually from a programme called The Conspiracy Files. 
Let's talk to two political commentators about that. John Rental is a chief political commentator for The Independent on Sunday, and Mark Pack is with us, editor of Liberal Democrat Newswire. Morning to you both. Morning. Good morning. Um, Mark Pack, some have suggested this damages Liberal Democrat credibility, does it, or...? I think not at all, because Norman Baker has got a very good record, very impressive record as a minister in the Department of Transport. It's also true he's got some uh, slightly curious, eccentric maybe even, views about the death of David Kelly. But I think what for me is really important is that that is sort of the exception. It's not that he's out there every day, you know, saying there are aliens hidden in the gardens and Bucking Palace or anything like that. There's one particular issue where he's been hugely sceptical about the official government line. He sort of put a lot of David effort Kelly. himself mm-hmm. exactly, put a lot of effort into digging up information and actually that scepticism I think will be very beneficial in the Home Office. Mm. John Rental. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't take that seriously. <laughs> I mean, th- this is someone who, who has taken a year out to, to write a book uh, about a theory which is so outlandish and so ridiculous that nobody can take it seriously. And to suggest that this isn't going to affect his job as a minister, he is not going to be taken seriously by the Home Secretary, who I understand is absolutely furious about his appointment, and the idea that uh, Home Office officials are going to give him the time of day beyond, um, you know, good morning and uh, thank you very much. I know, uh, John, you had written a little about his views of the death of Robin Cook as well, and I think you had to post an apology to him for that. (laughs) I apologised for briefly taking him seriously, because uh, he did suggest that uh, Robin Cook's death was suspicious because it happened on Ministry of Defence land. He then emailed me to, to say, oh no, I wasn't uh, suggesting that he'd been murdered. And then I discovered, because I haven't actually read his ridiculous book about David Kelly, because I don't read books, I don't waste my time on books about UFOs or JFK, but David Aronovich has written an excellent book on conspiracy theories and has read it for us, doing a, a sterling public service, and discovers that in that book he also suggests that Robin Cook, there was something suspicious about the death of Robin Cook. I mean, this is not a man who should be in public office. Mm. But I think that's not... If, I mean, in fact, John, if you look at your own sort of apology for your apology that you wrote, actually the words that David Aronovich picked up on were completely innocuous words uh, that <laughs> Norman Baker had written out, about, it, that the death had happened shortly after, you know, another event. And that was just simply a little no, bit the, of chronology no, Mark, in there. There was the, no, is, there no, was no Mark, allegation Mark, this is the way that conspiracy theorists work. They suggest, oh, no, I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that. I was, I was merely asking questions. This is absolutely not well, the way that serious say, people should do business. I should say we did invite him to come on the programme. He didn't, didn't particularly want to today. But Mark, in terms of how his relations work with uh, Theresa May, it, it's going to be terribly frosty, isn't it? It's not just because he's a Liberal and she perhaps isn't. It's much more to do with the wackiness of his views on a Well, I, I think there are many ways of assessing Home Office ministers, whether Theresa May, or indeed whether Home Office civil servants like them or not, is really not the prime objective you should have going into being a minister in any department. I think, in fact, if you go in you know, thinking, well, I've really got to have the civil servants like me, I've really got to have people from other political parties like me, that's a really bad way of going about doing a job. And I think, you know, John, in that sense, was, you know, was praising Norman Baker, I know he wasn't intending to, was praising Norman Baker by saying actually how he's likely to be somebody who doesn't immediately become an establishment figure in I the Home Office. I suppose that much you definitely can say for him. No one's going to say he's an establishment pushover, are they, John? <laughs> I mean, that, that is, in a way, that's a sort of conspiracy theorist's approach to, to government, that you don't actually want people to like you. You want uh, the, the, the Home Office, which, of is, tension, of course, which is, of course, the root of tension. almost all conspiracy theories. You want the Home Office to be against you. I'm afraid it is not the mark of a serious person. But, uh, like I say, with my podcast, Life and Life Only, this one, and Glass Onion, plenty of people have written to me. So the public are wising up, and COVID has done one good thing just made people question things when the covid thing started to hit the uk which around march 2020 we were all saying you know some of my friends who work in alternative circles we were all saying it'll be all about the vaccine six months from now and of course it was and i was absolutely certain that you know on social media and in the mass media as well people would just roll over and just accept it but in fact there's been a huge pushback and also with the vaccine passports. Again, David Icke, for example, was talking about that. I'm sure there's a video somewhere. I should try and find it. Of him 10, 15 years ago talking about you'll need vaccination certificates to do anything. And so many of the public are not buying it. And that has been heartwarming to me. Because it's not about being proved right. It's about questioning things, but really questioning things. Not just saying you're questioning things. Not just, I'll oh, have a go at the Tories for privatising the NHS. Yes, have a go at them for that. Scandalous. But you've got to look outside the sources. There's so much now. 
And uh, another point I made to Ricky, which he agreed with, you know, people talk about people on the internet peddling conspiracy theories. Who doesn't use the internet? It's not about it being on the internet, okay? The BBC's got a website. CNN's got a website. All the establishment media sources that are supposed to be balanced and reputable, they've all got a website. So people go on the internet. That actually doesn't mean anything if you really think about it, which is a perfect segue to talking about left wing and right wing. And again, Ricky did concede this. And he said, most of the public wouldn't know what left wing or right wing. Alt right. What does that actually mean? I'm sure, you know, this. someone has come up with a, a definition, but it's a manufactured definition. It's just a little name. And I was listening to a podcast about albums from the 90s, like something completely removed. And I think they were talking about Dave Mustaine. Yeah, they were talking about a Megadeth album. And one of them said, uh, oh, you know, Dave Mustaine's gone all right wing now. And the other one said, oh, he hasn't, has he? And, it, you know, they, they knew what each other was talking about in that what they meant was that he'd gone off the script. And maybe he has been saying outrageous things. I don't know anything about what Dave Mustaine's doing. But it was just the way there was that immediate recognition of just saying right wing. And right wing has got nothing to do with that. You know, most will know that right wing was to do with the court of Louis the Sixteenth. And if you sat to the left, you were for the monarchy having less power. And if you went to the right, you were for more or less an absolute monarchy. But now it's just a completely created position. Left wing is pro the environment. Left wing is anti-war. And those are good things. But then it's easy to get tagged, you know, as a sort of snowflake or whatever they call it. And then right wing, you can tag them as, uh, you know, out of touch, bigoted. And uh, we brought up Brexit as well when I was talking to Ricky. And, um, you know, I'll never forget the day after the Brexit vote. Someone posted on social media, and it was, I'm not going to name the person, but it was a person who was an intelligent person that I knew, had known quite well a few years earlier. And they said, oh, you racist cunts, you know, what have you done? And he, I think he even said, you know, you 52% of racist wankers or whatever. Buying into the idea that everyone who voted for Brexit is racist. Just this tagging is just incredible. And I mean, what's remarkable about it is if you take vaccines again, there's no position other than pro and anti. You know, obviously among people there are. You, know, you can be a vaccine sceptic, but then you'll get tagged a vaccine denier. And what does that sound a bit like? Holocaust denier. You, know, you might think that's crazy, but it isn't. I'm telling you, climate change denier. Language is chosen deliberately. You have to understand that. The idea that people in power do things deliberately is not a conspiracy theory. It's just a reality. If you just open your eyes and... Like I say, the central point, people won't debate. People won't look at evidence. Certain amount of people, as Chomsky said, forget about them. They're never going to change. When they get cognitive dissonance, which is when you have an entrenched opinion and then you get evidence that you know contradicts that, they'll just go with the entrenched opinion. You know, the old ego will come out. We've all got an ego. We all protect ourselves. It's very, very clear. It's not a great mystery. Getting back to my talk, I really would like to talk to Karen Douglas but again, I don't think she'd be very interested, to be honest. And she definitely won't talk to me if Ricky sends her our talk. Because again, I wasn't rude, but I said a couple of things. And really, she was making these just outrageous, uh, I don't know, associations. She, she was just making these wild associations that basically mean nothing. And then another point we got onto, she apparently says, conspiracy theorists believe in an unjust world. And as I said to Ricky... One funny part, I have to say, I didn't pick him up on this, but I'm going to do it now. Again, I hope he doesn't listen to this because I, I don't want to sound like I'm being nasty. But he said, oh, you know, you know, the world's getting better. There's a lot more money now. And then he immediately checked himself and said, it's not actually going all to the right people because <laughs> we'd, uh, we'd agreed. I told him about a stat and I don't know the exact stat again, but something like 50 people, the 50 richest people in the world have got the same as the poorest half. So three and a half billion. So it was funny that he checked himself because he realised, yeah, there's more wealth, GDP. Again, GDP doesn't mean as much as you think it does because it depends how that has been generated. It's not automatically a great thing. Like economic growth is not automatically a great thing. He conceded that the gap between rich and poor is getting wider and everyone knows that, but we just mostly ignore it because it gives us more of a fuzzy feeling to say, oh, we're all doing well, everything's fine, we're prospering. Check out Matt Taibbi's work on the financial crisis. There was a clip on YouTube of him talking to Joe Rogan about it. And if I find it, I'll put it in the show notes. But, you know, he's not a conspiracy theorist. He's made fun of 9-11 truthers. 
that he just laid out is not about conspiracy theories, it's just about reality. That was a complete and utter stitch up, a criminal act, and it's just been allowed to pass. And people will, yeah, they won't know the names of any of the people that are responsible for that. And don't even get me started on Obama. Watch James Corbett's film, Obama, A Legacy of Ashes. The guy was a, a complete and utter sellout. I mean, how can anyone take the Nobel Prizes seriously when he was given a Nobel Peace Prize? More or less the same week he started dropping drones on Pakistan. Just beggar's belief. And Ricky said, oh, I've got a soft spot for Obama. I understand why. Because if you didn't know any better and you didn't really pay attention to anything other than the mass media, yeah, Obama is a perfect example. He seems smooth. He's apparently faithful to his wife. I think he's a good, almost certainly a good husband and a good father. That's got nothing to do with anything, whether it's done in his name or not. That's the thing. I don't know Obama personally. People seem to think they know Trump personally and that he's a narcissist and they know Obama personally and he's a great guy. And it's that fucking simple. It isn't. I don't believe Obama wanted to drop drones on Pakistan, but the guy hasn't got any choice. You've got to understand that. It's a military-industrial complex. Bill Hicks said it best, you know. God, we need Bill Hicks now more than ever. He said, you know, and this was a joke, but it's making a very serious point. When the new president comes in, they're taking down the smoky room. You're in this smoky room, and this little uh, screen comes down. <laughs> and a big guy in a cigar rolled a film. And it's a shot of a Kennedy assassination from an angle you've never seen before. <laughs> It looks suspiciously off uh, the grassy knoll. And then the film, the screen goes up and the lights come up and they go to the new president. Any questions? Uh, just what my agenda is. First we bomb Baghdad. You got it. He's not saying that happened, but you get the point. It's the industrialist that got you in. It costs millions of dollars to become president. And um, you're immediately in debt. And people say, oh, yeah, your checks and balances and all this crap, and it's difficult for Democrats to get past the Republicans or Republicans to get past the Democrats. That's all true in the theatre of it, but there's way more serious shit happening than that to do with war and drone bombs. You know, people have absolutely given Obama a free pass just because they've bought into the idea that Trump is way worse. And it's really too much to go into now, but where does the public get off diagnosing people as narcissistic anyway? Yeah, Trump is a clown, you know, or certainly what's presented on the TV is a clown. But, like I say, watch this film, Obama, A Legacy of Ashes, and you'll see that he was no golden boy. And, of course, if you remember the clip of Trump making fun of the disabled, yeah, that was terrible. And George Bush had said that thing about, um, oh, there's no weapons here, looking under the table, making a joke about weapons, weapons of mass destruction. Do you not remember the clip of Obama and the Jonas Brothers? I'll put it in the show notes, and I'll, if I find the audio, I'll put a clip right now. The Jonas Brothers are here. They're out there somewhere. Sasha and Malia are huge fans, but uh, boys don't get any ideas. I have two words for you. Predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. You think I'm joking? We yeah. actually just got off the road on our own tour, the Look Me in the Eyes tour, which was unbelievable. Like the White House the other day. At the White House? Yeah. How was that? It was amazing. We met the president, I think it was the second time we meeting him. Uh-huh. And it was incredible. He was, yeah, was he jamming? Oh, he was jamming. Oh, I yeah. think he... I think he's a fan. Really? Because he leaned over. He leaned we're over. At, we were at the Easter egg roll. Yeah. He leans over after he had his little speech and leaned over and said, that's just the way we roll. And that's one of our songs. We were like, is it that just... One of his drones wiped out a wedding party. I think it was in Yemen. Try and imagine that the other way around. Just imagine what would happen if an American wedding party was all killed by a drone. But no, it's those people over in the Middle East. They don't value life as much. Who gives a fuck? And if you're listening to this, and I credit my audiences of Glass Onion and Life and Life Only, and hopefully Film Gold as well, with having very open minds, and many people write to me and say, oh, you've opened my eyes about things. I think you'll be open to this. And I'm not trying to turn you into anything. I'm not trying to tell you that people are stupid and you should stop relationships. You know, that's cult stuff of like, 
abandon your family because they don't believe you and stuff. It's nothing to do with that. It's just about opening your eyes and realizing where we're going and look up, you know, the bioterrorism and that whole agenda and the idea of this and the surveillance as well, which again, Ricky didn't really comment on. Let's go back to Karen Douglas. There's a clip, uh, there was a conspiracy theories conference, 2012, I think, and I did refer to this. She said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not actually interested in the truth about these things. I'm not actually interested in whether they're true or not. So why the fuck are you talking about them? Seriously. And then she, as I said to Ricky, she showed these two pictures of Paul McCartney using the Paul is dead as a straw man. But hilariously, the two pictures of Paul McCartney were both from before he was supposed to have died. And Ian R. Crane, who uh, I think died actually this year, or very late last year, I can't remember. Again, I didn't agree with everything he said, but he did a rebuttal, which is very good. Conspiracy theory versus deep geopolitics. Again, in the show notes. Watch it. He makes so many good points about there's a middle ground between believing the mainstream, believing the conspiracy, researching stuff. And there's no excuse anymore. And yes, the internet, you have to be very careful. There's a lot of rubbish on there, unsubstantiated. There's also a whole education out there if you care to look for it. So uh, this use of straw men, you know, flat earth, Paul is dead, AIDS was made in a laboratory. You know, then of course you get onto Elvis being still alive and it's just completely and utterly irrelevant. So Ricky talked about his paper to do with anxiety and the anxious attachment style, I think it was, and belief in conspiracy theories. And again, he's asking people to identify themselves. And, you know, it takes a lot, I think, for someone to identify their attachment style. But if we just take one question, again, I didn't pick him up on this on the t- at the time, but I'd like to. One of the questions, because we sort of, in a friendly way, he was giving me the questions, and I said I wouldn't be able to answer them because I'd end up writing five pages about them all. And one of them was about something about a small number of people controlling the world or controlling politicians so let's look at something that is absolutely provable again i don't have the latest stat the last thing i heard was four or five corporations so you had um, you know disney general electric the news corp and a couple of other ones control virtually all of the news that americans get on the daily news morning news nightly whatever it is the same stuff is filtered through these agencies, and most of it comes through AP, Associated Press, and uh, UPI. The central point is that there's a small number of corporations controlling huge amounts of information and news stations. So that's an example where there is a small number controlling a large number of people. And if you're in England, think back to, or in Britain, think back to Brexit. Think about how easily people fall into camps, because we are tribal beings, that's what we are very very difficult to change that so that is played upon so yes you can vast numbers of people can be controlled by a relatively small number so yeah the the thing that he was getting at again was this sort of stereotype of smoky rooms and 20 industrialists running the world it's not about that but that thing with the media and it's also slickly delivered but there was a video that i saw recently you know i think on the screen it's like 50 or even 100 news organizations all using the same terminology and it started out as a joke there was one a few years ago and it was something like oh yeah it was uh, like 21 shopping days to christmas get to the stores quickly and they had they had a night funny video of a hundred news stations using the same words but now it's got way more serious you know bears all the hallmarks of al-qaeda bears all the hallmarks of isis and again i just don't feel like people are getting that They just don't really pay attention or perhaps if they do, they just don't want to speak out. But I would say, you know, if you listen to this and you're pretty open minded, try and just subtly speak out amongst your friends. As I said, it's difficult in an office. You're in an enclosed place. You don't want to be tagged as the weirdo because it's very, very hard to be in that position. And I've been in that position. But by then I developed enough confidence. I just I would just give people evidence. And of course, they'd accuse me of looking on the Internet. (laughs) All the old standbys. You know, let's see if there's anything else we can look at here. Another point that I talked to Ricky about something to do with uh, people with insecure attachments, the need to be consistent, accurate and certain or something about needing to know the absolute truth. And I made the point that 
most of the people I know who have any credibility, who think in alternative ways, they're the opposite. We don't know how the world works. That's the whole point. We're trying to find out. So I reject the notion that non-mainstream believers are looking for certainty. As I said many times, I follow the Socratic view. Wisdom is knowing what you don't know. You start researching the world, just brings up more and more questions, but you keep plugging away and little bits of truth become evident. And really the light bulbs for me, and this is maybe something you can try, is when some alternative figure will tell you something and tell you how someone's going to react to a certain bit of information. And then when you try it, they react exactly the same. You know, this sort of defensive posture, getting angry, laughing at you. It's all very, very predictable after a while. It's not even an intellectual thing. It's a visceral reaction you get when suddenly you realise that they're right to some extent. Ricky, as I said, made a good point. It's not a very happy life to be investigating all this kind of thing. But you don't have to be shutting yourself away. You know, there's plenty of people. You know, James Corbett as a wife and family seems a fairly happy guy to me. You know, he's not a doom and gloom merchant. I try and talk about something, you know, when COVID hit, just immediately within my family is really basically no questioning of any of it. And again, I'm not a COVID denier. I'm just, you know, you have to see after a while that uh, a certain agenda is being set. And when, you know, someone talked to me, i will be all about vaccines in a few months. And of course it was. And, you know, there's enough information from doctors out there. Again, it's on the internet. <laughs> Don't let that put you off necessarily of people questioning vaccines. But they get labelled, it's the old familiar story. They get ostracised, they get made out to be a, a loony, a crank. And for a certain amount of the public, that's enough. Something I said at the beginning of the talk, it was actually Brett Vanut of School Sucks, and it was a guy called CJ, who has a podcast called Dangerous History. And they basically typified my position on this whole issue. They said, I don't trust anyone who believes there's no conspiracies. I don't trust someone who believes that everything is conspiracy. And in a nutshell... It's somewhere in the middle, but, you know, you just will never hear that. And the news, the media is supposed to at least have some semblance of representing public opinion. Do they really? I mean, have they for a long time? I don't know. Like I say, the public just seems to have very, very short memories. And when Karen Douglas goes on her podcast, I listened to a few of them and I just couldn't stomach more than about 10 minutes of it. Not challenged whatsoever. And if she was... You'd probably find there wasn't much basis, but, you know, I was talking to, to someone about this the other day. Once someone has gotten so far and gone publicly with a point of view, it's either their ego or just not, not wanting to lose their reputation. David Icke's the same, you know, challenge him, he turns a bit nasty. So it works on both sides. Whatever side of the mainstream conspiracy continuum you're on, if you're at either end of it, you're not going to go back. It takes a lot for anyone to say, I was wrong, I've changed my position. There's plenty of books on human nature. Robert Greene's book, The Laws of Human Nature, for example, that's a fundamental thing. We don't like to say we've been duped. So we will fight our corner and our ego will take over and we will do whatever we have to to tell ourselves and tell others that we haven't been duped, that we're not stupid. And maybe stupid isn't the right word. I'd say vulnerable, fallible to being misled by very, very slick media organisations. I used to watch 9-11 debates and most of the time, I would say, the person arguing for a possible conspiracy just laid out lots and lots of evidence and facts. David Ray Griffin, there you go, if you want somebody... He was a published author anyway. He wrote plenty of books on... I think he wrote on theology, actually. But uh, then he started writing books about 9-11. The other person on the debate will just be smug and will say, oh, conspiracy theorists don't believe in coincidences. And yes, you know, one coincidence you can argue away, but when you get to... 20 or 30, then you have to start asking questions. The 9-11 for me is not the best example. JFK is a good example because most of the public are on board with the possibility. But things like Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, they've really been allowed to fall into the conspiracy theory category. But again, there's so much research on those and there are just so many holes in the official uh, version. I think the phrase I was looking for earlier crippled epistemology that was the famous phrase from Cass Sunstein to do with um, epistemology is basically a branch of philosophy that's to do with knowledge conspiracy belief apparently cripples that you know you're not able to think and again I could argue exactly the same thing the opposite way so in conclusion the talk with Ricky I think was an interesting one got some good feedback but there was more to say and I hope this has given you 
more to think about. If you think this is all rubbish, of course you you have every right to think that. But I do believe that as a society we have some responsibility to hold our leaders accountable. And when I say the leaders, it's not so much Boris Johnson or Trump. It's the people behind them. And they may be names that we know. At what point, for example, did Trump go from just this sort of loony candidate who someone said it very well, his policies were everywhere from Occupy to the Nazis. <laughs> so it's sort of all over the political spectrum. And then suddenly he gets in there and it's all, um, I'm going to use hard right, meaning the way that it's used, you know, right wing, uh, to do with what the public understands as that, as being bigoted and not progressive and uh, apparently racist. I think there's a case for saying he's narcissistic, but, you know, what person who becomes president wouldn't be narcissistic? And like I said earlier, why is the public so confident about diagnosing someone with a condition, you know, without any training, with them not having any training? They just latched onto this thing. It's being led, as I said. And I wasn't a Trump supporter, but I, I am quite curious what happened to him between being a candidate and being a president. And I'm not sure I'd blame him personally. Like, I don't blame Obama personally, but you don't judge Obama as a guy because we don't we've never met him we have to judge him from what we see and what i saw was a teleprompter reading basically a, a stooge if you want to call it that for wall street go back to Canada, obama you know talking about prosecuting wall street didn't do any of that closing guantanamo bay i understand he, even in the game whoever's controlling the house or the senate if you follow it american politics apart from very brief periods of time and in fact during the Trump administration, I, I believe they controlled um, all three. I think it's the, the Senate, House of Representatives, and the administration. Apologies if I got one of those wrong, but there's basically three arms of the government, and the Democrats and Republicans invariably share those. So if you have a Democratic president, for example, you're more likely to have a Republican House of Representatives. So you see there is actually a duopoly. And um, what this all comes down to is just taking time to think and to just look at evidence and the public i'm telling you they're waking up you know the stuff i saw on twitter last year about vaccines and this year as well and vaccine passports i never thought i'd see that i'd be pretty sure there's about five percent of people talking about that and everyone else piling on them and calling them lunatics but actually no it was seemed to be i don't know almost a 50 50 split perhaps not but much closer to that than a sort of fringe five percent of dissenters so i think we are moving in the right direction and to circle back to my very first point, it's not about the moon landings. It's not about that. Sometimes it comes down to specific cases. You know, I would definitely investigate the death of Dr. David Kelly. But, you know, again, that's pretty much a missed opportunity because that's 18 years ago now. You know, but look out for these things as they happen and simply just try not to dismiss them. At the same time, don't let it get you down. You know, don't become one of these people that ostracizes their family just because they think they've discovered the truth. You know, we don't know the truth. We can just grab at little bits of it and we can keep our eyes open and keep our minds open as well, crucially, and pay attention. I keep mentioning James Corbett, CorbettReport.com, because he's just, to me, he's the most reasonable voice out there and pretty much everything he says is sourced. And your mind will be blown if you check out his website, which again will be in the show notes. So plenty in the show notes as well. There's plenty to look at here. And um, that's it. So thank you very much for listening. Take care and I'll see you soon. Goodbye. If you'd like to support my work across my three podcasts, which are Life and Life Only, Glass Eyed and John Lennon and Film Gold, go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Anthony Rotuno where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly or yearly subscription which will give you early access and bonus podcast content. Thanks again for listening.